Hello, I'm Anna Serrano, President and Vice Chancellor of OCAD University in Toronto, and welcome to the President's Speaker Series. Our goal here is to spotlight interesting, inspiring, and challenging voices that are shaping the present and future of Canadian society. In this video, I have the honor of introducing one of the world's leading journalists and freedom fighters, Maria Reza. In a moment, we'll bring you the keynote address delivered by Maria at the 2023 Democracy Exchange Summit. OCAD University co-hosted the summit along with Toronto Metropolitan University and the Open Democracy Project. It's a gathering of people from students to policymakers to educators to artists and entrepreneurs who are committed to engaging in conversations on pressing issues facing our democracy today. Maria Reza has been a journalist in Asia for more than 35 years, including running CNN's Manila and Jakarta bureaus. She co-founded Rappler, the top digital news site that is leading the fight for press freedom in the Philippines. In her work, she has endured constant political harassment and arrests by the Duterte government and was forced to post bail 10 times to stay free. Today, she's still facing charges for speaking and publishing the truth. For all her incredible work, in 2021, Maria was one of two journalists awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of her efforts to safeguard freedom of expression. Among many other awards, she was named one of Time Magazine's 2018 People of the Year for her courage and work on disinformation and fake news. She's also been named one of Time's most influential women of the century. Maria has written three books, including her most recent, How to Stand Up to a Dictator. The book is a wake-up call about how we cannot take our democratic freedoms for granted. And beyond her battles with Duterte, she also explains how social media platforms have allowed misinformation to spread, threatened our democracy, and contributed to growing authoritarianism around the world. Now, why is OCAD University interested in Maria's work to preserve democracy? Well, our democracy is fragile. We all have a responsibility to fight for it. And we believe that artists and designers have a pivotal role in this fight. The systems, narratives, policies, and built environments in our world did not manifest themselves naturally. They were constructed, designed. If we want a more free and democratic society, then we as artists and designers are responsible, along with everyone else, for ensuring that the systems and environments we create, we construct, reflect these values. I hope you are as inspired by Maria's story as I am. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it is good to be back in this hall. Uh, this isn't my first time here, uh, when it was still called Ryerson University, which actually is part of everything that has changed, right? Uh, and you look at the Philippines, and you can see how quickly history can be changed in front of our eyes. It is empowering to a degree, but it is also in a bit like quicksand. Um, let me pull up. I will speak for, you have to tell me like when it's 30 minutes, because I want to make sure we have enough time to chat. And I want to ask, I want to hear your questions. Um, first, let me start with this book, uh, how to stand up to a dictator. Even the title was, was, I was conflicted about it at the beginning, but then over time, it really became, I think, what we each need to do and why I hope every one of you in this room will come out and actually realize that that battle that seems like it's in Ukraine is actually right here in your pocket. In the Nobel lecture I asked for, I said, this is a person-to-person -person battle for facts, a person-to-person -person battle for integrity. Let's start with how nuance has been lost, right? And I'll start with like just a story of one of the toughest decisions I've had to make as a reporter. First, I'm really old, uh, and I don't mind telling you that this is my 37th year as a journalist. Uh, starting in 2016, I've never lived through anything like this. And the last time I was here on this stage, I kept getting arrested that year. 
10 arrest warrant in 2019. And, you know, it was a little bit of a respite to feel like I could come and speak and, you know, feel like I could speak. Uh, I want to tell you about a difficult decision I had to make. And this was in the late 90s. And it is, it shows you the values, what makes journalism different. Uh, this is in East Timor, Asia's newest nation, actually. So it became a nation in 1999. 2000 was when it really became its own. But in 1999 to 2000, I was with my team. I was then Jakarta Bureau Chief. We had set up in, we were in the capital, Dili, and I had heard that there was, uh, there was violence, four hour drive away in Suai, where there was a church. Refugees had taken uh, refuge there. It was pro-independence versus the Indonesian military and the militia working with them. We were driving 45 minutes out of the capital, Dili. It was very, very early morning in the gas station. One of my best sources, a pro-independence guy, stops us when we were getting gas. He was shaking and he said, you know, please, please take me out. I'm, I'm afraid. He was afraid for his safety. I was the head of a team whose task was to go to Suai and so we thought about it, and you know, we could have put him in the car with us, but we were walking into militia and Indonesian military territory. That would have increased the risks to us exponentially. So we said, you know, I'm gonna come back. We're coming back eight o'clock that night. Please meet me here, and, um, and we'll take you back to Dili, and we can help you. We went to Suwai. Father Hilario, a Filipino priest, was among those killed there. There was a massacre. We were driving back that night. We were a little bit late. We waited an hour and a half for him at the Likisha station. By that point, it was almost deserted. And I had to take my team and go back to the capital. I didn't know what happened to him until weeks later. And yes, he was killed that day. That, those are the minute per minute decisions a journalist makes in conflict areas. A lot of journalists are making those decisions in the Ukraine now. I think Indonesia was one of the first times, if you read my book, it was one of the first times that journalists became targeted. This was 1998, right? After Indonesia, it was East Timor, then Iraq became. Several of the first journalists who were killed were friends of mine. How has it evolved? Let me bring you to the problem today. The reason I tell you that is because these types of nuanced decisions um, are what every person on social media needs to make today. Because, and let's go through, right? Uh, ah, come. Hmm. Nope, doesn't wanna. Yes, can you make it? Maybe I, oh yay, all right, got it. Well, so this is the book, uh, one more time. I think we have to pull this up, sorry guys. Yes, okay, so that's the book, right? And in the book, I actually wind up saying, you know, it's, it's ah, I wrote, I got up every morning at 5 a.m. for about a year and a half, a year to write, and then, you know, it was while, uh, in 2019, I had 10 arrest warrants, and um, I just kept coming back, and then I just kept posting bail. Uh, I'd never lived through this. I'd done nothing differently, mind you, through the years, right? Uh, the question I asked at the end of it is, you know, what will you sacrifice for the truth, for the facts, for your values? Um, and let me take you through some, because this is kind of what I do in the storytelling, what we've been taught to do as journalists, it's the micro to the macro. And there is no time like right now to show you how the micro and the macro has really shifted. This isn't, let me just sit, stand here because it's probably easier. All right, um, ah, come here. 
Bear with me, guys. You know, I'm very short. That's why I don't like standing behind a podium, because you won't see me. <laughs> so um, I want you to look at just the chapter titles, uh, because it's personal first. So let's do the micro. People always ask, so how do you know why, why, all the whys, right? Uh, the golden rule is very simple for me, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a simple rule. It's almost an, it's actually in all five major world religions. Uh, and then this, the micro is in italics below it, make the choice to learn. The honor code is something from my old university where we would be in a room like this and you know the professor would give you the test and you have to actually write, I pledge on my honor that I have not violated the honor code. That means that you pledge that you have not cheated, but that you also pledge that you will turn in anyone else you see cheating, right? You're in your area of influence. And you'll see how that plays a role later in how we think about the mesh, which is, I think, you heard from my colleague Mia Gaviola about what we created in the Facts First PH Pyramid. The Speed of Trust is a chapter about how do you build trust, since that is what's broken. So many people will tell you, you know, you gotta be strong, which means never bring your shields down. But if you never bring your shields down, you're never going to make a true connection. So what I learned as a journalist is to tell the best stories. I walk into these areas where people let you in the, the height of joy or the worst of disasters. And what you do is you walk in with your shields down. Be vulnerable. It's actually hard to do this on social media today, but it actually is how we make the strongest connections. Um, I'm going to take you forward, this is probably easier this way, let me pull this out. Let me take you forward to ah, the very last, the chapter seven, which is the chapter on Facebook. It was our discovery of what Facebook had been doing. You know, this, I jump off of the part where uh, uh, the two systems of thinking for human beings, think slow, thinking fast, thinking slow, thinking fast. Thinking fast is your instinctive, emotional. Um, thinking slow is where journalism happens, where democracy happens, where conversations happen. Uh, what's happened is that our biology has been hacked to change the way we feel. By doing that, we change what we think and ultimately the way we act. And I show you the data and the evidence, some of which I'll show you today. The, the third one, I think the, the last one here is chapter 10. I like this one because this is also a debate. Don't become a monster to fight a monster. You have to have drawn the line. It's, that's a chapter as well. You know. You're sitting here, and maybe part of the reason you're sitting here is you believe in these values, but you have to draw the line where on this side you're good and you cross over your evil. It's, I know we're told not to do that as we move into rationalizing almost everything that we can rationalize, because we're very good at rationalization, but draw the line is critically important. And in chapter 10, Drawing the line helps you not become a monster when you're fighting a monster. Uh, and that leads to the subtitle underneath that, Embrace Your Fear. This is my response to the question of how do you, why do you stand up to Duterte? How do you do it? Where do you find the courage? Well, it's actually more about thinking of the worst case scenario, really holding it, embracing it, preparing for it so that you rob it of its sting. That's how we survived six years of the Duterte administration. How I survived almost 103 years in prison hanging over my head. Uh, now it's only seven years left. So it's actually an improvement. It just took four years and two months, mind you, right? Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll and this will be the last part of the book, right? 
is hold the line. You heard our former Vice President Lenny Robredo talk about holding the line because Nietzsche was right. And this is my personal lesson because so many people, including my family, who I just saw right last night at the wedding of my niece, who we weren't sure she would actually grow up and get married because at five years old, she had cancer. Anyway, uh, it was, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. This is what we learned in Rappler. Let me go quickly over those lessons because I want to make sure um, Anna and I have. So let me summarize this, right? In the Nobel lecture, I talked about how uh, this is now a person-to-person -person defense of democracy. I speak to you today because I want you to realize that this battle is yours, that it isn't in Ukraine, that it isn't in the Philippines, it isn't out there. Canada knows, but Canadians are, like I said in 2019, are far more powerful than many of us in the global south. So please take note, what we've lived through is death by a thousand cuts. And Madeleine Albright calls it slicing the salami, but I use this because I studied Al-Qaeda and how the virulent ideology traveled both in the physical world and in, in the virtual world, right? And what they said is the way you Osama bin Laden targeted the West by saying that he will run after the West with death by a thousand cuts. Imagine this asymmetrical warfare turned upside down, now used against governments and against the molecules of a democracy. What are the molecules of a democracy? You, right? Because micro-targeting allows geopolitical power to come down to the cellular, molecular, molecular level of a democracy. Mind you, sorry, too much coffee, so I'm gonna grab a drink. Um, so the last part, I talked to you a little bit about embracing your fear. I think that's part of our problem. And one of the best examples I can give you about this is how we, the government threatened to shut us down in January 2018. And when they did, um, within four months, we dropped 49% of our advertising revenue. And we would have actually closed shop if we didn't find an alternative sustainable business model. So what did we do? We imagined the worst case scenario that could happen, shut down. And then we workflowed it and we drilled it. Drilled it, as in like if we were doing, if they came in now into these doors and you guys are sitting there, you would know exactly what you would need to do if the authorities were closing us down, right? That's what you need to do. And guess why? You, because we will, ah, I keep picking this up, it doesn't work, right? Um, we will have to do something like this. And you'll see my timeline is very quick next year. <laughs> let, me, let me talk about that. Let me quickly go through this. Um, and I'm going to try to do this in, in 15 minutes. <laughs> OK. Uh, it's about data. Big data is different from an Excel sheet. And what I find when old power governments, academics, sorry, academics, journalists, old power, we had power, right? So we can't quite fathom the way new power came in, which is technology. Right? Technology is the difference between an Excel sheet where your mind can actually go through each point and a fire hose of data that comes at you that you cannot actually go through, but a computer can. And that is a massive transformation. It transformed every single industry. Like when it transformed hotels, we were like, oh, okay, Airbnb. When it transformed transportation, oh, Uber, it's good for us. When it hit information, when it hit information, and this is an MIT study from 2018, when it hit information and the distribution platforms, which are the tech companies, spread lies at least six times faster than facts, it turned the incentive structure upside down. Imagine if you have kids and you tell your kid, lie, I'm going to reward you. Keep lying, I'm going to keep rewarding you. I compare it to sorry, because I come from the Philippines, I compare it to Netflix and Stranger Things, you know, the upside down, 
where it's deceptively familiar, but everything is corrupted. It's covered with ooze. We live in the upside down. I became a journalist because information is power. And here are the three sentences I have said repeatedly since 2016, which is when we came under attack. If you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without any of these three, we have no shared reality. We can't solve any problem, let alone have a functioning democracy. I feel as sorry for government officials trying to do the right thing as, for, as I feel for people like me, journalists under attack. And I will show you the data behind this, right? It is an impossible situation. Um, here's that phenomenon, and this is what happened in 2014. It would have been 2014 when I run a news organization. I ran the largest news group in the Philippines, and then when we started Rappler, we became very quickly, by in a year and a half, the third top online news site. Well, what happens when you separate the content from distribution? Distribution is tech, content are journalists. What are the principles behind distribution? Again, we can go to all the studies that have been done, but in 2016, we felt it first, right? It has, it's an outrage attention economy. You're rewarded if you're outraged, if you attack, if you're a bully, if you want to sit and actually have a real conversation, the distribution doesn't move as fast. We know this, the facts prove that, right? So it's separate the content from the distribution by 2018, finally, the studies, like we knew this instinctively in Rappler, we began pulling data together, but by 2018, MIT comes out with this study that says lies spread at least six times faster than facts. If you infuse it with fear, anger, hate, um, white replacement theory, you do far better. This is like rewarding lies, guys. This is why we live in the upside down. And that has created number three, where the very platforms that are supposed to connect us, that are supposed to give us information, is actually a behavior modification system. This is firsthand experience. And there are two ways that we're, we're actually like Pavlov's dogs, right? There's something called A-B testing, where I'm gonna try out new code on you guys. Let's talk about it like a drug. I give you a drug, drug A, and I give you here drug B. There's more people in here. So drug A is fatal. I'm so sorry. And then we keep going, right? And part of the reason I wrote the book was because we needed an end to the impunity. So how does information operations, or what Russia calls information warfare, move? Information warfare has long been part of Russian military doctrine. Um, Yuri Andropov, a former KGB chairman, actually said, he said, disinformatia is like cocaine. You take it once or twice, you're okay. But if you take it all the time, you're a changed person. This is the corrupting influence. I'll, from here, I'll be going to Seoul to the Summit for Democracy there. This, believe it or not, the corruption of our information ecosystem is part of the corruption that we're going to be fighting, right? So, so behavior modification system. So how do we deal with it? This is how far behind governments have been. They separate them into buckets, right? They think they're all different things. We look at antitrust. We look at data privacy, we look at content moderation, we look at user safety. But here's what actually happens. Every time you open your app, or uh, no, you don't even have to open it because it, it captures your data. When you pick up your phone, you post, you're posting on Facebook. I'm here in the auditorium, you post a photo. Machine learning comes in and takes all of that. Say you've posted 1,200 posts and then uses predictive analytics to build a model of you that knows you better than you know yourself. That model, we've known for a long time, right? But replace the word model with clone because that model has your relationships, all your relationships, has everything that you've put in, is predictive in approach, 
right? So then what the companies do is they take that clone of you, they take artificial intelligence, take all our clones together, and they create the mother load database that is used for micro-targeting. Please make no mistake, micro-targeting is not the old media advertising, right? Micro-targeting targets you at your weakest moment to a message for the highest bidder. And geopolitical power has used this marketing advertising system for power. Okay, don't worry, I won't really depress you all the way. Um, it's not that bad because we didn't have a name for the business model until 2019 when Shoshana Zuboff wrote a 750-page book called Surveillance Capitalism. In fact, I think I talked about this here in 2019, right? Okay, that's one of it. Let me just show you some of the stuff that I've lived through. In 2016, we came out with a three-part weaponization of the internet series. You know, I wrote two of the three parts. I was told this was the first time, the second piece I did, how Facebook algorithms impact impact democracy. Uh, I was told this is the first time it was questioned. We're very close. We are alpha partners of Facebook. So I really, truly drank the Kool-Aid. Um, this is part of how we grew so fast. But that third piece done by my co-founder, Fake Accounts Manufactured Reality, we spent three months on that, looking at 26 accounts. All of them were proven fake, and then three months counting exactly how many others those accounts could influence. It was at least three million others. 26 fake accounts influences at least three million others. Um, this is what happened to me after we published that. And it was fascinating because as soon as we published this three-part series, I was attacked. It got to a point on a Sunday night where I, I stopped answering because it was still so new. Uh, I stopped answering and then I just started counting. And I started, I was getting an average of 90, 90 hate messages per hour. This was the network. So what we did, and you've heard, you've seen Nerve, which is what Mia Gaviola runs, I think you saw her. Sh what we did is we began to look at social network analysis to track these, I don't like being helpless, um, but also natural language processing to see what are the messages that are being pushed out. And so this is, these are the two ways information operations work. The first is to pound you to silence, which is what they're trying to do to me here. Pound, right? 90 hate messages per hour, who, can deal with this, well, you really can't. And probably I was silent for two weeks trying to figure out what it was. Then we decided to get the data. Um, the second thing that it does is only the target sees all of it. It's like that elephant and everyone feels one part of the elephant. And one, but as the target, such a curse and a blessing. <laughs> Strangely. So that's when we realized, oh my God, okay. Um, the meta narrative they were seeding, this is the third part of an information operation, was setting the stage for all of my arrests. By 2017, the meta narrative was um, Maria is a criminal, journalists are criminal, hashtag journalists are criminal. This is the first wave of 10 waves of networks, so organized that each one of these are broken down by demographics. This one is in charge, oh, where are you? There. Okay, so this, oh, you really can't see. This one on the left is kind of deals with the thinking class. The one thinking Pinoy is in charge of the middle class. That's, the, that's content creation and distribution. And finally, our mass base is a singer dancer who has attacked Lenny Robredo significantly. This is the same network that also attacks, but those are the vectors, right? I can tell you so much more about it, but the discovery is quite fun. What travels on these? Let me show you some of what I've dealt with. Things like this, you know, you wake up and you, you're a cave person and you know, everything about me was attacked. They were looking for everything vulnerable. So that meant um, the way I looked, the way I sounded, my gender, uh, my color, my skin color, depending on where they are in the world, and 
this is a global network that jumps in on top of it. Especially if I do anything about India, for example, that's a crazy one. We could talk more about it. Then this, you can see that they made, made my skin look far worse, but it's because I, it, this was something that was actually very painful at the time, but I mean, you develop a thicker skin, sorry, on skin. I have very dry skin. I have atopic dermatitis, eczema. And when I'm stressed or when I don't sleep, my skin breaks, right? My skin looks better than this. But having said that, this is what they, I'm not corrupt. I have been a journalist for a long time, so it was very hard to break me down. Um, so then it went, it moved from that to here. Dehumanization, right? This is a familiar tactic. We saw this in Nazi Germany. This is, a friend of mine was saying, these are similar tactics. And um, Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta, before a car bomb assassinated her, she was receiving similar things. Women journalists, women politicians, women researchers looking at disinformation have to deal with this. But this one, I, I, I shouldn't leave it on that long. Um, <laughs> It took the platforms forever to take this down, forever. And the first one that I got, my mother sent to me. I mean, you know, it's like you don't want these things to be happening. Um, but dehumanization is critical because in the end, that bandwagon effect that they want, they want you to jump in. They want you to be your worst selves. Look again at the design of the platforms, right? Fear. Anger, hate, us against them, gets you the greatest distribution. It is retraining all of us around the world to do this. Um, a Thousand Cuts, the director of A Thousand Cuts is shooting her film. Ramona Diaz is here uh, shooting another film. But this is, you see what they did to my skin, but they're kind of almost funny. Scrotum face is what, is what it's called. You know, they just kept at it. There was a period of time especially after all the legal attacks began. You know, it's bottom-up social media attacks. You say a lie a million times, it becomes a fact, and then the same thing comes top-down from President Duterte, in my case, right? Um, and then, when the platforms begin to take it out, they then create code words. No journalist should have to live through this to do our jobs. Scrotum face. I'm not alone, and this is the best part, is that we are finally, it's almost like climate change deniers, you know? We're finally getting to the point. UNESCO came out with this report with the International Center for Journalists. It's called The Chilling. They did a big data case study of about half a million attacks against me, but there were other women journalists. There are almost 300 pages of this. You can see that 73% of women, now we're talking about gender disinformation, 73% experience online abuse, 25% received threats of physical violence, and of that, 20% became violence in the real world. So there's a reason why I increased our security six times in the first two years, from 2016 to 2018. Our security remains high. This is what, what they found with me, right? Um, and it's about what you would expect. This is information warfare. And what's the goal? 60% of the attacks were meant to tear down my credibility. 40%, they were meant to tear down my spirit. This is at the molecular level of democracy. And I don't think it's a coincidence that as attacks on journalists increased globally, more journalists have been jailed and killed in the last decade. You also have more and more attacks. And in the last two years, if you follow VDEM, right, as of 2021, 60% of the world was under authoritarian rule. As of just this January, they came out with a 2022 study. That's gone up to 72%. And this leads, I know I'm running out of time, no? Uh, I, Anna says I can still keep going. Um, okay, uh, 
I want to bring it. So this I've shown you. This is this shows the same type of attacks that happened to us in Rappler, but this is in the U.S. and it stopped the steal. You have your own version. You know, a little bit of the truckers, a little bit of Canada is not. I think Mia did some scan for you, but um, this shows you. This is a, a map. This was a timeline that was put together by the Election Integrity Partnership. Stop the steal, election fraud. Right? We saw something like this happening in Brazil. We were among the first to, to show it in Bonn um, before the elections. But take a look at when the narrative was introduced. Again, very similar as the attack against me a year before. And earliest op-ed on RT was August 20th, 2019. And then you see it with Steve Bannon on YouTube. Surprise! You guys know who he is. The mainstreaming begins with him, then Tucker Carlson takes it forward, and then you're already in October 2020 when QAnon, which was still allowed on the platforms, I mean, come on, QAnon was banned, as was, you know, accounts like Alex Jones, but what about the damage those accounts did, right? Why does that happen with impunity? This one, QAnon drop, happened in October 7th, and then President, then President Trump came down in November, right? Called out, this is Stop the Steal, this is the violence on Capitol Hill, first time it's ever happened. Okay, I, I know I'm running out of time. Let me end with these two wonder, no, 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 I'm not, I can't end with the last two big problems, but two things for you to think about and then solutions. I, that's where I will end. Yes, says Anna. Okay, um, I already talked about how social media has been used for warfare. We know this firsthand. We've survived, but my God, right? I, I had to be prepared to go to jail. January 18th this year, when I went to court, there were four criminal tax evasion charges. And I just submitted myself because I just couldn't believe. <sighs> I couldn't believe that the Philippines, that our systems had so degraded that I would go to jail. I thought it was just, you know, it's like a game of chicken, high stakes. Anyway, so here's the part that you don't hear a lot about. But I, I studied biology, you know, I, my freshman year I was doing genetic research, and one of the things that's happening now is the impact of all of this information operations, right? It's happening in every country around the world. It is, it could have been a force for good, but because, because the, the goal is profit, it hasn't been, right? Because the goal is to keep you scrolling, because the goal is to hold your attention with outrage. It's been harmful. And, you know, you guys are a little older than the high school kids that I talk to because I worry about the next generation. Um, but, all right, so what is it? The three levels of impact on us. At the personal level, those folks who went to Capitol Hill on January 6, 2021, believed it. The violence in Brazil on January 8 this year believed it, right? Caused by people who believe it, like like what, what the former KGB chairman said, you're forever changed and you, rehabilitation takes a far longer time because our cognitive biases kick in. So the first level is psychological. If you want to look at it more, look at the 10,000 plus pages that were released by Francis Haugen, the whistleblower, the impact on teenage girls who have higher incidence of eating disorders, higher incidence of depression among teens. Suicide is the top killer for teens today, right? So you see this all around. We are, it's at the personal level. This is very similar to the way Al-Qaeda, how virulent ideology um, radicalizes a person. But now it's in politics. So we'll go back to that. The second layer is sociological. Groups behave differently from individuals. Groups in the chapters I showed you, the chapter on Indonesia is about it's about where I learned about mobs, 
right? Because in 1998 to 1999, I was going city to city to city every week, and it was violence, one group against another. It was after the end of Suharto's rule. He, it was like opening Pandora's box, right? And the people in those mobs, the individuals are really nice people. But the mob, the mob kills, right? So sociologically, on the group level, we've known these studies. Milgram, we've known the conformity studies. These have all people behave differently in groups. And when you encourage mobs, which is what the design does, you get the damage of mobs. The third is the last part that I think not enough research has been done on. This is emergent human behavior, or you know, if you think about it, evolutionary-wise. It's the evolution of our species. The longer we allow this to continue, the worse it will get, because literally our synapses, you know, our attention span, when I was a TV reporter, it would be, you, Maria, you need to capture their attention in the first 10 seconds. I had 10 seconds. The poor reporters today, they have three seconds, right? That's the attention span of a goldfish. Guys, how can we teach our next generation meaning if they have ADHD, right? This is what the technology is doing. And I think they need to be part of the solution, but we need to look at the solutions. Um, finally, the last two minutes of <laughs> democracy. Um, I pegged 2024 as the tipping point. Between January this year and then, there will be 90 elections globally. How will you have integrity of elections if you don't have integrity of facts, right? How will, you, uh, how will you make your choices if there is insidious manipulation at scale? I was in Paris when Macron, um, so I, I'll talk about the solutions, but you know, right now, I was in Paris when the Yellow Vest protests began. And I went out in the streets and everyone said, they organized on Facebook, okay, yes. But when I was leaving Paris, there were cars burning on the streets. I could not, I, it's normal, right? So it was actually, that's when I realized, finally the last part, we are electing illiberal leaders democratically. It is connected to the rise of the far right. And if you're rightist, it's okay, you can be rightist. Let's just all live in the same world of facts though, right? Like, but what we are seeing is that part of this is because they are exploiting the information ecosystem that allows lies to spread faster, that allows outrage to get the message out clearer. And those poor folks who don't want to lie, who don't want to incite hatred, where do they go? Right? So we've seen this happen. I've seen this, that woman you saw introduce me. Um, I have a solution though. Don't worry, I'm, I'm still depressing you. I gotta go to the solution. But here's the last part, right? So we are electing illiberal leaders democratically. When they do, like in my country, they crush the institutions of democracy from within. President Duterte did that within six months. He was the most powerful president we have ever had. And slowly, I mean, the fact that 34 years in prison just went away last January, you know, it's, the independent judiciary is kicking back in, and that is one of the ways that these damaged democracies move forward. Um, but those countries don't stay in their country. They ally with each other globally. And now we are seeing, actually, the democratic countries, your trade power, your ability to use economic power against the autocrats, is actually quickly diminishing. You can see this in the VDEM report as well. So what's happening is, I'll put together Ann Applebaum and, and my ideas in this. Um, Ann Applebaum talks about autocracies. I live through kleptocracies. So globally, power and money drives it, and it is corrupt. All right, let me, let me give you solutions. <laughs> May I? I gotta stop, okay. There's three pillars in Rappler. These are the same three pillars I showed you here in 2019. Technology, journalism, and community, 
right? Because we thought my elevator pitch in 2011 when I raised, the seed fund for Rappler was all of $2 million. And we built something that, you know, held up under Duterte. Um, we build communities of action, and the food we feed our communities is journalism. You can replace, replace journalism with facts, which are really boring, right? Facts are really boring. And we spend our careers learning how to tell good stories so we can keep your attention. Well, here's what I'm doing now on the technology end. Rappler's building its own tech platform. I would have had it done by 2017 if we hadn't come under attack because all that money to build the tech went to pay our legal fees. Um, but now it's called Lighthouse. And what we'll do is, you know, we have to build communities of action and the debate can continue as long as it's evidence-based, as long as it's fact-based. The second thing is, I think when in dealing with technology, let me give you a timeline. Long-term education, it will take you a little while to actually see the fire hose of data, see how it connects with tech, see the impact. If you're trying chat GPT, let's chat, right? I mean, there's so many wonderful, horrific things happening simultaneously. We're living on quicksand right now, and that's weirdly exciting because we can also create Right. So long-term education, medium-term legislation. And this is what I've spent the last two years at the EU, the last time I testified. I think even for the disinformation group for Canadian lawmakers, we were talking about, uh, Francis Haugen and I testified simultaneously the last time. I know you have legislation up. We can discuss that later. In the short term, it is just us. It is just us. It goes back to you, and I'll go back to that. Journalism, journalism needs to survive. The business model is dead because micro-targeting has taken over from advertising. Micro-targeting delivers better returns, but you're killing, actually you're killing the group that is stand, that's supposed to stand up to power. So um, I co-chair the International Fund for Public Interest Media with Mark Thompson, former president of the New York Times and BBC director general. Last year, we raised about $50 million from democratic nations, new money for journalism, um, and we're about to roll them out now. So that's a good thing, because we need to help those poor journalists putting their fingers in the hole in the dam about to break down on us. So that's, that's the second part. And then we need to find new forms. I'll tell you more about TikTok later. Community is the last part. This goes to you, right? Um, we build communities of action, and I will show you some of those things. Let me end with a community that we built that actually gave me great hope. Um, if you if you watched Mia's presentation, um, this is what we did in the Philippines, and you know we were supposed to start it in October of 20. 20, 2021, October 2021. But that Nobel announcement got in the way. <laughs> and so we didn't, we didn't start it till really the end of January. But let me tell you what it is. And, and frankly, you guys should be considering something like this. Four layer pyramid connected by a data layer. Um, we did this in conjunction with the Google News Initiative, believe it or not, yes. They can be good guys, they can be bad guys, but we also did the data pipeline with Midan, which is a San Francisco startup. Bottom layer, 16 news organizations working together. Never happened before in the Philippines, even though I've been trying, we've been trying to get them together since 2016 when we saw the danger signals. 16 news organizations doing fact checks. Remember, fact checks are really boring and they don't spread, right? So you create the second layer, we call it the mesh. Think the honor code again, right? You're responsible for your area of influence. So that layer, the mesh, is 116 civil society groups, human rights organizations, climate change organizations, all these NGOs we work with for a whole host of issues, kick in the church, kick in businesses. The businessmen finally came in, right? And what they did, their task, I think Mia showed you what we did is, we did an influencer marketing campaign for facts, those boring facts. And their task was to share these boring fact checks, but add emotion. And they couldn't use anger. 
So what did we discover? We were actually able to take over the information ecosystem because we discovered that inspiration spreads as fast as anger, right? That was critical. The third layer are these academic institutions. Um, there were six of them working with us on it with the data pipeline. They take the data every week leading up to elections. One group will, do, will tell us who is being targeted, what is the meta-narrative kicking in, and who benefits, right? You, you can imagine who continued to benefit. Finally, the last layer, which is the layer that was quiet for so long, legal groups. They came in, and within less than three months, they filed at least 20 cases to protect the pyramid. You cannot have rule of law if you don't have integrity of facts. So this is still ongoing. Um, Without elections, it doesn't have the same oomph. But what we are doing is also moving out of the virtual world to the real world, and we need to form these communities of action up until we get the right legislation in place. I will leave it at that and leave it. So let me leave it with this, right? I bring it back to you. Why is this important? We couldn't have done this. I mean, the lies that were spreading through our societies leading up to the May 2022 elections were off the scale. Things like, you know, um, we go into some of the poorer neighborhoods and we ask them, so really, who are you voting for? And then they would say, oh, I'm voting for Marcos. And then they'd say, you know, I, I, we would ask why. And then they'd say, oh, because I'm gonna get gold. And then we ask, where? Where did you hear that, read that? YouTube. Let's, we'll, go, we'll talk about the network clustering algorithm, by the way. We can do that during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Um, so I'll ask you just a couple questions, but I don't want to hog the stage because um, I know there's quite a few people here who want to ask you questions. First of all, your book. What a marvel. Um, everyone has to read this book uh, because it's, yeah, then there, and there, there it is. Here's mine. She's my friend, but it is worth the read. <laughs> no, the data is there if you're yes. interested in the data. But here's the thing, okay? Because it's a love letter to journalism and journalists. It's a leadership book, especially for women leaders. It's a, a kind of a, a, a forensics sort of um, uh, uh, observation and kind of unfolding of what you went through. Um, it's a call to action for democracies. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a how-to book. Like I've never read a book actually that encompasses all those things, and then it's all wrapped around this incredible, authentic voice where you were open to revealing yourself to people in a way that. Frankly, I did not expect when I was reading it and made me love you even more. <laughs> and, and I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, in retrospect, when you're reading this, you, you're like, how can, you, how can you read a book about how to stand up to a dictator without knowing who that person who's standing up to the dictator is? So can you tell us just a little bit about, you know, how you were able to be so um, open and vulnerable and authentic um, throughout that year that you said you write this book, all the while under this like, you know, a guillotine where you could be going to jail any minute. I think maybe because that was there. I didn't know what tomorrow would bring. We could get shut down any day. Um, I had, we were doing the journalism, but I think more than that, it was heartbreaking to see trust broken globally. And, you know, how do you regain trust? I mean, that was a question that was there. Um, strangely enough, it's been so atomized by social media that uh, if you, how do you regain trust? It's person to person right now. And so I figured people have seen me uh, so many people have helped. Oh, the part I didn't tell you. Oh my God, how could I miss this part? You have to believe in the good. 
right? I fundamentally believe human nature, humans are good. And that, you know, if you remember like the cartoons, okay, I'm turning 60 this year, so I'm older than most of you, but you know, those, those old cartoons where it's about your conscience and there's a devil and there's an angel and you, you want to do something and the, the devil keeps telling you, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And then the angel keeps saying, no, don't. It'll hurt other people. It will be unfair, right? Well, what social media has done by design is it's gagged the angel and flicked it off your shoulder and then grew this devil so it has a megaphone directly into your nervous system. Social media is mildly addictive. If you haven't read a great book that came out um, uh, called Dopamine Nation by an MD who's with Stanford University, right? This is addictive stuff. In fact, some friends and I from the tech companies point out that you know, maybe we should consider putting an age limit like alcohol on social media, right? Because your young kids are unprepared for this. Anyway, so, so the idea for me, I mean, to direct answer to your question, it was, it's all in the subtitles. Be vulnerable. I, how can I expect you to trust me if, if I don't drop my shields? If you have a question I haven't answered. The second one, the mission of journalism is a chapter title, and the subtitle is Be Honest. Right? When I first landed in the Philippines again in 1986, this was people power. I didn't even talk about how Marcos Jr. is back in power. We had, but, you know, it, there was such a feeling of euphoria. And I, I felt that um, there were so many possibilities that now have, are obscured because everyone kept telling me, Leading to that, right, as the pendulum swung and the same problems persisted, people want quick answers and the rise of authoritarians tell you, and this I've lived through in Indonesia, the Philippines, most of Southeast Asia, uh, you don't really want to do the tough work of thinking and deciding. You want someone else to do it for you and just give you the results of it. That's why there's a kind of nostalgia for this authoritarianism in some of my countries. But they also told me when I first came back to the Philippines, you know, if you're not corrupt, you're not going to do well. I'm not corrupt. I'm now 60, I'm still not corrupt, you know? I've stood by my values, that's the last part. So if people tell you that you can't do the right thing to succeed, they're lying. It is doing the right thing is the right thing. That's what the Nobel Prize said. <laughs> and you know, what's interesting is we had Anand um, Giri Daradas um, with us on Thursday, and he, and, and actually Kareem very rightly kind of commented that his new book, The Persuaders, had a lot of women of color in it. And in fact, all these champions, change makers, the persuaders themselves were women of color. And um, uh, he, and he spoke about how, uh, in fact, there was a strength and vulnerability in all of them. And, and that is your brand. <laughs> your, your brand is you're both strong and vulnerable at the same time. What I realize is that that's because you started in theater. <laughs> that was the one sort of tidbit that I read in this book that was a remarkable thing. And my question is, you know, as a, as a person, uh, uh, there's a lot of academics here and a lot of um, people. I happen to, uh, uh, you know, uh, be privileged to be serving as a president of an art university. Yay. So, <laughs> so my question for you is actually advice I'd like from you. Um, where is the role of art? In that pyramid of facts, okay, the fact, well, in those kinds of pyramids, yeah. um, you talk a lot about facts. What about the kind of um, inspirational things that can come out of artistic practice? It isn't in facts. You don't get it in facts, right? And this is part of the reason in the mesh layer, we had artists, cartoonists. We had moms who were his history buffs doing TikTok, right? It, it is, so here's the thing. 
I am always an optimist. I'm ever an optimist. And what I hope will happen out of this period of creative destruction is that journalism and art, to a degree, will mesh, right? Because art uh, appeals to the part that isn't rational or isn't logical, right? That's the way we speak. Um, I didn't speak. English very well when my family migrated back to the my, migrated to the United States. I was ten years old, and the way my I went to a public high school, a public elementary school, and what they did is they taught. I learned piano, um, and music is a way that um, that it's these are forms of communication. Um, art opens you up in ways. I think now, as we go to the end of 2024, I didn't tell you why we're in the last two minutes. The last three major elections in 2024, right, is going to be India, world's largest democracy, Indonesia, world's largest Muslim population, and your neighbor down south. Um, they will. Those are the three 2024 elections. Canada has held the line largely, but I think I do think Canada can do more, sorry. Um, but uh, so, so art is when no one knows who to turn to. I get this question all the time. So who do we trust? Most of the time you can see you will trust your family and friends above news organizations, which I think is partly because of the erosion, the attacks on news organizations that have happened repeatedly. These are information operations. Uh, so where are your family and friends? If they're like my family and friends, I think it's in the book, you know, but my parents voted for Trump. Uh, but they don't like Duterte. Uh, so it's, it's actually, I think we see so many divided families. And I, I come, like you do, from different cultures. And it's the boundary spanners, someone who connects different cultures. I think it's in these areas, it's in the creativity of people where we will find the answers moving forward. So big fan of the arts. I mean, yeah, let me stop there. <laughs> And before I turn to the audience, I just have one last question around the young, the young people, because we've got tons of students. We have a ton of students also virtually. And um, in fact, Justin Ling said something interesting earlier, which is, you know, are we being too um, uh, sort of cynical about them? Because can't they just turn off? Aren't they also just turning themselves away from Facebook, turning themselves away from you know, Instagram, and turning off their phones. Um, you speak about the fact that they might not be able to because it's too addictive. But could it become so out of favor if we talk about it enough that they will actually do the, the work for us? You think our rational mind controls our emotions. It's the other way around. Even before social media, the study showed that 80 to 85% of the way we vote is not based on what we think, it's based on how we feel, right? It's why you have campaigns the way they are. So it's emotions that win, and when your emotions are repeatedly triggered, and when you are being commodified, right? Really think about this. The last time human beings were commodified was the age of industrialization, and it was labor, right? What happened? We had those robber barons, and they had sweatshops. They ran factories 24-7. They had child labor. What did democratic countries do? They put laws in place. And what did labor do? They created unions. Now. What's being commodified is our attention, our emotions. And in this age of outrage, there are no uh, safeguards, right? So I would say the two groups that abdicated responsibility for protecting us are the tech companies that took over the gatekeeping role, because news organizations were held accountable. You can sue us. It is our jobs, right? We, this is why there's a mission. It is a love letter to journalism. But the other part, the other one that abdicated responsibility are democratic countries. You know, there's a building code for this building. It is not going to fall down around us. 
Why can we be treated like Pavlov's dogs through our emotions and how we think? Why? Why do I have to deal with these attacks that in the old world would never have been allowed in traditional media, right? So you can, I, I've done all the arguments because I was the one, we created Rappler. It's purely digital. So I've come from both ends and I will tell you the data is really clear. Great. So Will, before we um, turn to this audience, let me t look at our virtual audience on Slido. The first one is, um, what is your message to Filipino immigrants who want to be civically engaged here, but struggle because they need to provide a better future for their families? Oh my gosh. Wow, that's, that's actually really critical. Because look, let's be real, a post-pandemic, Econom the economy is going to be critical. Everyone has to take care of their families. Please keep watching the news. Don't avoid the news because it's bad news. This is one of those things. Um, I would say talk to your families, right? Don't uh, avoid the emotions. In the book, I talk about how I wanted to be Mr. Spock. <laughs> but I also value Captain Kirk. And I always wanted to put them together. Be Mr. Spock if your family is very, very emotional. But, you know, it starts in the physical world. Um, and this is part of what we're doing in the Philippines now. We're moving from the virtual world, which is now so corrupted that it is really difficult to have foundational discussions on critical things. I mean, we're at an existential moment for climate change. You know, the Philippines is, um, starting in 2013, the third most disaster-prone country in the world. So, um, Filipino diaspora, um, you are more powerful than many of your countrymen. Uh, pull your family close together, the honor code, right? Uh, do your mesh, because when we put our mesh together, um, we're both boundary spanners. It'll be interesting when we put those networks together, uh, what we can do together. The power is still there, and I continue to appeal to the tech companies, right? Moderate your greed, uh, because there's tremendous potential for good, which is what we found in Rappler when we were beginning this. We were mapping information cascades. That's why we had a mood meter and a mood navigator, and it was there four years before Facebook did their emojis, right? So, uh, last part. If you haven't yet read, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler wrote a book um, many, many years ago. It's called Connected. Connected, the, the thesis they put in there is the three degrees of influence rule. Based on real world data, this was done for a heart study, the Framingham, Massachusetts Framingham Heart Study. They had three generations of data and they were able to look at that data and they proved that emotions and behavior spread in the physical world through three degrees of influence, right? I looked at it, smoking spreads through three degrees of influence. But even an emotion like loneliness, where you think, you know, lonely, if you're lonely, you kind of stay in your room. But if I'm lonely, my friend has a 54% chance of feeling lonely because I do. My friend's friend, the second degree, has a 25% chance of feeling lonely because I do. And my friend's friend's friend, third degree, has a 15% chance of feeling lonely because I do. We are all connected, right? That's not, and this is part of like where religion, I, we, didn't even, we haven't even gone there. But long answer to your question, you know, please do not give up. Yes, take care of yourself, you must. But at the same time, take care of the world around you and our goal is to connect the mesh together. So if you go and reach out to them and you don't give up, I'll just uh, go to question two, which is like, how do you also play that role as, the, as, a, as, a, as a bridge to ensure that you stop the flow of misinformation and um, the radicalization of your family members? What, what are some of the, the you know, uh, uh, you, you kind of alluded to it by saying, like, if you just spew out facts, you know, maybe that's not going to work it too won't. well. <laughs> so what are the kinds of things that we can be doing? Hug them a lot. 
hug each other a lot, spread love, not hate. Now I sound like not a journalist, but you know, um, it, it really is person to person, right? This is part of what I've realized in this. And as a journalist, I really kind of stayed away from it, but both the micro and the macro tell you this. Um, my friends in the United States, their families are divided. Um, it is, I'm looking forward to seeing some study on emergent human behavior, but this is impacting us, all of us. Uh, we've never had so many connected on these platforms. And if you think Facebook is a blunt mallet, TikTok is a surgical probe, right? Uh, when you're on TikTok, you have no choices, right? The less choice you have, the more effective it is in, in dealing with this. So, yeah. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. And in fact, it was something that Morris Mitchell, another uh, keynote that we had, talked a lot about, which is like, you can't actually, um, you don't realize how important kindness is. And love. And <laughs> compassion. And, and understanding that we're all swimming in the same sort of situation. So we should expect dissent and, and, and difficulty and difficult conversations. And, our, and, our, and we just need to be able to hold that with kindness and compassion. Think creative destruction, right? I also said this in the Nobel lecture. We are standing on the rubble of the world that was. It's deceptively familiar, but this isn't that. The systems are falling apart. Our relationships are falling apart because what connects us, the tech companies that connect us, actually are in, in, injecting themselves into this. I mean, in the Nobel lecture, I asked for an end to section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which gives these tech companies impunity to keep spreading lies, right? They can make more money at this, but this is also why journalists are under attack, why I've had to deal with this stuff, why many, many more. I mean, if you were vulnerable in the old, in the physical world, LGBTQ+, if you're an ethnic minority, you are far more vulnerable online. And we haven't yet found how to really deal with this. Our, we're like spag throwing spaghetti against the wall because Rappler is there in the trenches and I'm not just gonna sit there and keep getting hit, right? But we have standards and ethics, we have values. That's the other part that I think you know, what are tech's values? Well, that's certainly what the Canadian government is trying to figure out. And we've got a very specific question on that, which is, what are your thoughts on Canada's um, proposed online news act? I read up on this just because <laughs> I knew you were going to ask. Um, my quick take on this, and please let me, you know, I, I think that C18 is trying to fix a broken business model that isn't the the core of the problem, right? I, I always talk about, uh, about our information ecosystem like a river, right? It's a polluted river because remember that factory that has all of our clones that is micro-targeting, it's spewing out lies into the river. Well, that river, that polluted river, content, content moderation is like taking a glass, scooping up polluted water, dropping in that tablet that clears it up and then you throw it back in. That's content moderation. Uh, C18 doesn't go far up enough. What is it doing? It's almost like a square peg in a round hole. Uh, because in the end, look, I'm a disruptor in my country. Rappler um, was, I think before we came under attack, we received the largest we grew the fastest and received the largest investment of any media in Southeast Asia because we had ideas of, of community, technology, and journalism, right? Um, but my old network that I managed, were they happy that we were doing this? Absolutely not. Did they want to kill Rappler? Yeah, absolutely, yes, you know? Um, and what we've seen, I think C18 looks it's very similar to Australia. It's collective bargaining. Um, the big players win, for sure, right? But it's, again, a stopgap measure. But please remember, for the digital players, and I'm going to give you kind of some averages across the world. If you're a purely digital player, let's say 40% of your traffic, 40 to 45% of your traffic will come from Google. 
The rest of it, depending on the, the social media, uh, how, how deeply it penetrates your society in the Philippines, 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. It's not even social media. Um, so depending on that, social media can kick in 40% to 50% of traffic in the global south, in Brazil, it's a lot, right? Take away both of those, your digital players will die. Um, unless you're willing to do more, right? What's the problem? The problem is to fix the information ecosystem. The problem is to turn the world right side up so that facts, so that lies don't spread faster than facts, so that facts reach you so that you can make a decision. And that can't be in an environment where you're constantly bombarded for profit with emotions to trigger outrage. That's core, right? So that's why, I mean, the closest we come to it is the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act in the EU. They have the Democracy Action Plan. That's been a while in the making, but you know, I always say the EU is the fastest of the turtles. Um, it's out this year, right? It, kicked, it was approved last year, and spring this year, it's really out. C18 is half-formed, and I worry for you um, what that means, because that means you take them out of, you take the facts out of social media completely. It's actually exactly what Mark Zuckerberg did in January 2018. Right? Before the Cambridge Analytica scandal happened in March 2018, they could see it coming, and he said, really, I want you to stay connected to your family and friends, but you know what that means? You don't have facts in your feed. That means disinformation spreads more, right? That is dangerous, and what we saw in countries like Slovakia in January 2018 is that traffic to Slovakian news organizations dropped 60%, right? There are these are cascading failures, right? And there is evolution and innovation that needs to kick in. So that's, that's the only thing. I know you have two other laws that you're looking at now, and online harms hasn't really been fleshed out, but I've testified a lot in the UK on this, and again, it's the same thing, right? The big players, and they might kill me, no. <laughs> um, those with power want to keep power. This is a brave new world, and you should, be, you should have a seat at the table as we create the future. This is what it is. But here's my thing, I, I will say for Canadian legislators, because I think you've been thoughtful about it. There's danger to them as well, right? Because it is so hard to communicate nuance in any of these. So in a way, what they're doing is letting tech and media fight each other out. But in the end, who will survive this? Is this going to be good for the public? They're going to, they stepped out a little bit of it. And I think this is problematic. Uh, sorry, Canada <laughs> can do better. <laughs> Well, this might help, actually. Um, I know that there are folks who have questions. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, here, I can get it. Oh, sure. One more Slido question. OK. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. One more Slido question. Um, people from your own country and beyond have tried to break you down and discredit you through the years. How do you continue to see the good in people? Oh my gosh, because, I mean, first Rappler, right? I got to tell you, when we came under attack, so when we got our first shutdown order in January 2018, I held a general assembly because it was a different, it was different. And the median age in Rappler is 23 years old, right? And we were, at that point, 63% female. And I worried that their parents or they are worried. And so you got to address the elephant in the room. And I held the General Assembly and I said, we're walking into a new place. We're being really, we're going to be attacked. This, is, this could get really ugly. So if this is too much, please let us know. And we will try to place you in another news organization. Because you want, if people are afraid, it's better that they go where they, we, 
Rappler Small were about 100 people, right? So, so the first was, if they were afraid, I wanted to know right away. Remember, embrace your fear. But then the second thing is, I also felt that if we didn't address that, then it could be corrosive, right? Because, because this is what the government was trying to do. Not one of our editorial team wanted to leave. And if anything, from 2018 to when, when the cases started going away, uh, all of the normal friction of a news organization disappeared because we were extremely mission-driven. This is the best part. Okay, guys, this is a pet peeve of mine. Please, if you want to be an influencer, do not be a journalist. <laughs> we're not influencers, we're not PR. Journalists have a set of standards and ethics, and we actually stand up to power when power has tremendous, can actually punch us, and we've been punched. But this was a team that weathered. So that, that was the first, like, um, they, when we were tired, the older, the co my co-founders and I, they stepped in, and, uh, and then our people. Oh my God, the generosity of strangers, people I didn't know. Uh, I'll give you one quick story, right? During COVID, I had, uh, like, actually it was right in the middle, I had another arrest warrant, and I, what they do is they, they leave the arrest warrant for you, they don't tell you, they issue it, and then they try to time it on a Friday so that you can get picked up and spend the weekend in jail, right? Well, this time, this was Thanksgiving weekend or something like that, so it was like Monday was a holiday, and I got a tip at like 3.30 in the afternoon that I, there was another arrest warrant for me. And so I ran to the courthouse, which was 40 minutes away. I get there, and I, I, pro, I was proactively trying to post bail so that I wouldn't get arrested. People were scared, but I got the document. Then, then they said, oh, you have to pay downstairs in the basement. I get to the basement, and the cashier was closed. <laughs> But they were still there, so I, so I said, please, 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 if you don't allow me to post bail today, I can't go home, because I could get arrested, and you know, so many things can happen, planting of things, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the woman looked at me, and then she went to, this, she went to the back and got her supervisor, and they opened the cashier. I said, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> they opened it, and I posted bail. I mean, yeah. uh, right? The goodness of human nature. Yes. I can see the, the folks in the, <laughs> on the ground that were clicking. Oh, we have to wrap. That's what we're told. OK, so um, I guess the last question that I'll have for you is, uh, um, What's next? I mean, I know there's a, a lot of fighting. I mean, not fighting, but you're fighting for um, getting a lot of the things that you have set forth as an action plan started, and you've, you're halfway through them. Um, you gave a series of actions in your um, Nobel Peace Prize um, uh, speech of what should be done. Um, how far along the, that road do you think we are? And um, are, is that... Is that what you're going to concentrate on? Or is there something, something else that you're thinking of that you'd love to share with your newfound friends here that um, also excites you? Now until 2024, I'm sprinting, you know, because I want you to know how much is at stake for the world. It really is a battle for these values and rights. And I know these are your values and rights. And I've come back to Canada a lot, because not only do you hold these values and principles, but so many nice people, <laughs> you know, you, you really, um, anyway. So I, I think that's the first, is a, it's a final sprint. Like, could it be that maybe two out of those three, maybe some of the elections and we kind of stumble along, yes, it will get harder, it will get worse. Um, but the more people who know, the better we will be because it is at the cellular level, right? This is a battle at the cellular level. Demand better from the tech companies, demand better. Listen, you know, if I were in government, I feel sorry for people in government today because how, they say one thing, 
things that they would have said as you know, raising the price of oil, for example, which was necessary in different ways, um, now is violent. How is that? How can you govern if you can't use macroeconomic tools? Um, so, but then beyond that, I think here's the last, because we must end. We can build better, right? I mean, look at the, it's not as if the old world was wonderful. <laughs> there were lots of things that were, that were good that have now been trampled, but this is, what, this is part of what we're doing in Rappler. I mean, I'll tell you what we're trying to do now is figure out what is the next cycle look like? Because the business model is truly dead. What does our public want from us? What will they demand from us? And then here's the other part. Just because the public wants it doesn't mean you give it. Because, you know, this is what I learned in, in running the largest news group in the Philippines. If I only chased what you wanted, I wouldn't give you anything substantive. I'd give you crime and entertainment. That's what our primetime newscast rewarded. But because we are journalists with standards and principles and the goal to educate the public to have a robust democracy, we spent money on stories like you know, sending a flyaway to the southern Philippines because there's conflict there, and then watching our ratings plunge because you need to know about this. So it isn't a popularity vote, you know? Um, and I wish sooner or later we leave the popularity in high school and move to better governance, you know, a more just and equitable society. That's the mic drop, folks. Thank you so Thank much. You.